Good evening and welcome to tonight's shir. Today is Thursday of Parsha Shreftim, Base Elul, and I want to dedicate this shir to uh, my newborn grandson, to born to my son Mendel and his wife Chaya. This should be a bit of bismana. They should have lots of nachas from him and all the their children in good health. Let's go on. We have a list of questions, some very interesting material today. But let's start off with the first one. And that is that uh, if you haven't realized, this coming Tishri, we're going to have three sets of uh, three day Yom Tov, as we call it, yeah, where it's going to be Yom Tov Thursday, Friday, and then it goes into Shabbos. Now, the question which we're dealing here with this at this moment is if you have a Fabrengen on Yom Tov afternoon and it continues into Friday night. So, and then it comes to benching. So, what happens? So, if you will, now there's a whole procedure called Poyas Mahapam Akadosh to enable you to continue from Friday into Friday evening of making Kiddush in the middle of the meal. Uh, but all right, there's, there's some reluctance about doing that. And so if you did do that, then you're going to say both uh, say and If you didn't do that, so you've eaten on Friday and it comes sunset and you stop eating, but by the time you get around to benching, it's going to be already nacht. It's going to be after nightfall. Do you say now it's now this is now Shabbos? Do you say it's say or in benching or not? So here we have on the screen from the Alter Rebbe Shechanoch Simukuf Peches, which deals with the various additions in benching. So he has the in Sif Yud Zayin. He writes if the Suda of Friday spilt over into night, is a Friday spilt into night, or let's say Er Rosh Chodesh. Because sometimes be also, let's you go to a wedding, which is on Erev Rosh Chodesh, and then it finishes off into Rosh Chodesh. Could be the other way around also. It starts on Rosh Chodesh, finishes off on Motzei Rosh Chodesh. So, but meanwhile, we're talking about it starts on Erev Shabbos, and it it's, continues into Shabbos. So you should be mentioning Shabbos in your benching. Im ochal kazayis mekach hashech hashecho. Contingent upon if you ate a kazayis at night. So, let's say... Uh, sun, let's say sunset is at six o'clock and dark is seven o'clock, so quarter to seven, and you're benching at seven o'clock. It's definitely Shabbos. If you ate a Kazais because you did uh, this whole thing of the person of Kaddish, then you can say, then you should say, let's say in bench. Even though at the beginning of the meal, you didn't need to say, let's say, because it was Friday. But because once you had kazais of bread after nightfall, okay, so you had a kazais of bread on on Shabbos. Then you have to say it say. So meanwhile, it's only if you. So it, it, what he's looking at is, if you physically ate on Shabbos, then you have to say it say. If you ate on Friday, but you're benching on Shabbos, so you don't have to say it say because your duty of benching. Is from before Shabbos. That's the first opinion. Yes, yeah, Shaimri, there is a second opinion which says that even if you didn't eat a Kazayas later on, but since you're actually benching, it's Shabbos now. As you're saying the words, it's Shabbos. Therefore, the second opinion says you should be saying Ritze. Then what would happen if it's the other way around? Um, if you had, let's say, Shal Shuddhas on Friday, on Shabbos, and you finished, it's very much a Shabbos. So according to this opinion, you have to be honest to the time where you are saying the benching. So according to this opinion, you would not say to say uh, on Motzah Shabbos because it's not Shabbos anymore. So they're, they're looking at in real time rather than your affiliation to when you where you began eating. And the halacha is like the first svar. And that's in, in that what? that we go according to the beginning of the meal and therefore if you started a meal on Shabbos 
and you finish a Motsa Shabbos, you still say the Tzay. And here, but then also, if the other way around, there's, there's, there's two points here, yeah? If you, di if you didn't eat a Kazayas after nightfall, so then you don't say, then you don't say uh, Ritze, yeah? So let's leave that clear, that if you eat on Friday and you did not bench, but you did not eat anything after nightfall, and now it's nightfall and you're benching, since you do not have any food on Shabbos, then you'd bench with outward say. You'll say Yalav Yove because you started the meal on Friday, which was Yom Tov. But you would not say it at say because you did not eat a Kazayist after nightfall. If you do want to eat a Kazayist, then it goes involved with the whole story with the person of a Kaddish, which is you know, a separate, separate discussion. But this is the way the question was. If a person doesn't want to eat a Kazayist with Shekha Sheikha, then there's no Ritzay said at benching, even though it's Shabbos. Let's move on. So, someone in, it is in Crown Heights, Someone got in contact with me researching about the wording in the, the prayer of Nachem, which is said on, on uh, Teshavov, we include it in Mincha. So, the earliest source we have, it's very interesting. I mean, I, I, I spent last night, he called me up and we spent about uh, probably about three quarters of an hour discussing. He had, he really had done a lot of research, very interesting. So the earliest source of, of Nachem is in the Yerushalmi, both in Baruchas and in, Ta and in Tanis. And you can read the words there. Rav Acha says, well, what you have on the screen is not from the Yerushalmi, it's from the Rif in, in Tanis. But he's quoting the Yerushalmi. Yeah? So he quotes the Yerushalmi. Rav Acha says, Yochim B'tishavol should be mentioning B'me'ein Hamo'oiro. Like you do Yalavayovoy in benching. So here, um, well, on da or in davening, sorry. And Tishabov, you should be mentioning about Tishabov in your davening. What would be the appropriate Me'en Ham Oira, like um, reflecting on the event of the day? So he has the whole thing, Nachim Hashem, Rekeno, Israel, Mecho, Shleim, Mecho, etc. Then the Yashami Azvehechon Oimer. Where exactly do you insert this? So Yabiramia says, well, we have a rule. If something is relates to the future, it belongs in Ba'avoid, which is in Ritzay. If something belongs to the past, then it belongs in Haidor, which is Moidim. Um, and that's, so the al is in Moidim because it's echo echoing the past. Um, the talk about Tushchodesh, etc., somehow is addressing the future, and therefore it is in Ritzay, which we call Avaida. So now, the Yushami doesn't really answer the question. It just says that it depends on whether it's a part for the reflect of the past or the future, and sort it out the way you understand. It was very, very interesting that on the um, margin of the Yushami, the, the Mephirish Pnei Moshe, he understands that it belongs in Ritzay. Whereas Rashi on the riff here, he understands, no, it belongs to the past. It's, it's reflecting the past, therefore it belongs in, in Hoidor. That really, all of this is academic, because the riff then continues. Whilst your Shalmi had given two options, to say Nachim, either in Ritzay or in Moedim, Nagi Almo Lememre Leboine Yerushalayim. Despite the two options given the Yerushalmi, those options are dropped, and we come up with it in the minute is a third option to include it in Bain Yerushalayim. Ah, how does it belong there? So he says, this is all the riff. Now, from this point on, it's just the riff. Till then, it was the Yerushalmi, and for Benagi is the words of the riff. And he says, um, you have a Gemara in Avedazara, that although generally you should be, if you have personal requests, they belong in Shemea Tefilo, but if you wish to include Besoiv Kol Brocha, Me'ein Oisa Brocha, if you have a request which relates to a particular Brocha of Shemea Estra, you can include it towards the end of that Brocha. Therefore, Boine Shalayim, that's the appropriate place to talk about the, um, the lament and the request. 
of the uh, about your Shabbat. Okay, so far this is just the origins. Now, what this fellow is picking up on is on the wording. And there's a difference between the Tilas Hashem Siddha and the Torah Ur Siddha. And that is in these words. It has been referred to Shalai. It was swallowed up by legions. By Yudoshuha. And it was possessed, inherited. Now, in the Torah Ur Siddha, it has Oivde Pesilim. Whereas in the Tilas Hashem Siddha, it has Oivde Zorim. And he was probing what exactly, which one is, is more correct. So, first of all, what's the difference between Oivde Pesilim and Oivde Zorim? And he's coming from a uh, thing that are we trying to include, exclude um, Christians? And being that the Sidurim were printed with a scrutiny of a censor, therefore anything which would be offensive to the set, to the Christian censor, that would be changed. So he's wondering whether Oivdev Silim is somehow to appease the censor. Oh, we don't mean the Christians because they don't worship images. And therefore, um, the Oivdev Silim is to appease them, whereas Oivde Zorim somehow is to include any of it, including Christians. That was his theory, which I'm not I'm not ready to buy, but okay. He's very, very interesting. You see here the Lashonis, um, the various Sidurim. And now um, perhaps we discussed it before. We know the famous thing that the Alter Reb had um some 60 Sidurim when he was putting together his Siddur. So I think it was 36, but he had what were the Sidurim which the Alter Reb had in front of him? So we've got here number one, Siddur Shalom, printed Top Ein Zion, that's printed um 50 years before the Alter Reb, or 30 years before the Alter Reb is born. And so here it has those who worship the stars. The second print, which is three years before the Alter Rebbe is printed and born, again, so these are two prints for sure the Alter Rebbe had access to. And then we got closer to his own time. We've got the print of Rabbi Yaakov Emden, who was printed around the time the Alter Rebbe is born. And he has changed it to Vayiroshua Oivde Fasilim. And then we've got a Siddur, which for sure the Alter Rebbe had, called Based Filo by Reb Zalman Hena. Also, he has Oivde Fasilim. And then we have now the first print of the Alter Rebbe, which we have, which is from Tofkov Samach Gimel. Again, Vayiroshua Oivde Fasilim. So you see here that. That that was the accepted nusr, and as I said, that's what it's followed in the Siddur Torah Ayur. But then we got in the other Siddurim, as in the Tilsa Shem Siddur. Now the Tilsa Shem Siddur is a copy of the Siddur which are printed in, in Vilna in Tofresh Ein Aleph, but even earlier than that, in Tof Kuf Tzadik Vov, um, some 13 years after, no, some 20, 23 years after the Alter Rebbe's passing, we've got the printed in Skopus, also has already Oivde Zorim. So the variations of Oivde Zorim, Oivde Vasilin already are then. Um, now, I have a problem with the term Oivde Zorim. It just doesn't seem correct to me. Oivde Zorim means they worship, they work or worship foreigners. When you say Oivde Avoida Zora, so the word Oivid means to worship, Avoida Zora, a foreign worship. Now they understand. But when you say they it was possessed or inherited by servants or worshippers of strangers. Doesn't just doesn't make sense to me. Um, as if you'd say, oh, it's the it's the um, the Eritreans are serving the Thailanding in in Israel, Yeah, these immigrants are serving the other, and they were the ones who um, you know protect, took possession of your life. It just doesn't make sense to me. Okay. In the middle of a shear now. Sorry, I can't talk. Here's very, very interesting. The Sfardi Nusach, as in relative contemporary Sfardi, okay, Vayiroshua. 
end of sentence. They do not have a Yerushua of the Kachav. Or Ayurif Silim. They just have a Yerushua. Now this, as now in the earliest Fardi editions, as in Rambam, it's Vayeshua of Dov Silim. Rambam, we have the from the manuscript published by uh, Rav Kafach, it's uh, as we have Ayurif uh, Silim. But in the last 200 years, we'll see the word, it, it, the sentence is cut short by Yerushua. Possibly the following. Possibly the following. A, in a Sephardi country, in Morocco, in uh, Tunisia, or in uh, Baghdad, so the censor is looking at their ma, at their siddha. And they, when we read these words, Yushalayim was swallowed up by the legions and possessed by the Evde Kechovim. We obviously are referred to the 2,000 years ago. But they couldn't say, but you're sure it was taken possession by, and th th who's holding it now? So we're saying it's possessed by Oivde Kechovim. Hey, no, no, no. They're saying it's possessed by Muslims. So why are you saying by you're sure Oivde Kechovim? It's, it's, it, no, you, you, are, you are insulting the current uh, Islam uh, control of, of, of Yerushalayim. Chas Shalom. Um, to say anything about now, but uh, and and therefore, okay, they dropped it. We are really going by Yerushua. Just leave it for history, not for contemporary, because by Yerushua, the Kaisovim could be referring to the contemporary. That's a theory why they Svardim dropped that the end of that sentence. At any rate, so this is we had this uh, discussion, and he, he's he went into a whole theory. As I said, I had this conversation. He was suggesting that this is referring that in Nachem we've got very addressing various stages in history, and there was a time where Yerushalayim was overtaken by the Romans, but Yidden was still living there, and then there's a time where it was overtaken by by the by by Christians, um, which I really I don't know my, the history very well whether uh, whether the Romans at the time of the occupation of Yerushalayim and Churban or or a, you know, a short while later, whether they were actually Christians or not. Um, so I don't know. But that was his suggestion by Yeroshua, is one phase, and by Yeroshua, referring to Christians, is at a later stage. Okay. Um, let's move on. Okay, so um, I give the same shear in, in part of it in Hebrew on Wednesday evening. So I had sent out the, the, the list of questions in Hebrew, and a, a, a Reb Mendel Greenfeld, who is in Nachlas Achabad, he sends me a message that he's actually dealt with this question. He's done a fascinating job. He's done a research of the publications of Merkez Lenyon e in the 40s, 40s, 50s. He's, he's made a, a, color, a whole color, a uh, full color uh, journal of various publications of Merkel's Lenyon and Chinuch. As we know, the Rebbe got off the boat, <laughs> Sivan Tovshin Aleph, and he starts and then publishing all these different things. And so we all know the Tishri uh, volume on the Tishri, and we know the volume of, um, uh, for, uh, for Pesach or for. I never knew that there was a booklet on the three weeks. I've never seen this. So this, as you can see, it's printed in 1944. The booklet um, uh, dedicated to the three weeks. And as I'm sure a lot of us remember, the small yellow booklets for um, Simchas Torah with Hashanahs, the yellow, bright yellow cover. So those were also published in the same period. And they were all retypeset. They were typeset in America. So the typeface, which you see here, this is from the Schulzinger Press in, in uh, was it Brooklyn? Or it's tried, I don't know. But here you see that, I mean, the Rebbe was very much on top of this. So the Rebbe in this publication has kept to the Oivde Fsilim Nusach, rather than the Oivde, which is in Terra Oir, rather than the Oivde Zorim Nusach, which is in the Siddha Tils Hashem. Why did he not change it till Sashem? Okay, there's a famous several answers of the Rebbe that when they published the Siddha Til Sashem, it needed to be, they, they, they did not have the resources 
to edit it thoroughly. And so there's lots of uh, editing there, but not, 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 it's not so, all right, some things they left as it was. It wasn't so, so significant. And I feel actually it's not so significant. It's just, it's just a fascinating discussion. But this is very interesting that someone shows me then Toph Shindal that the Rebbe had it reprinted in the way it is in the Torah of Siddha, which is the Siddha which the Rebbe used. Um, Rebbe Arya is telling us that the order was Romans, Byzantines, and they, when they were um, uh, Christians, and then Muslim. Uh, yeah, what's, what's interesting to know at this point is at what period did the Byzantines come in? Were they um, at the time of the Khurban? or uh, shortly thereafter, or much after. That's really uh, crucial to this discussion. But, okay, fourth century, I presume you're saying, which is well after the Khurb. Yeah, right, let's move on. Let's move on, and that is also a fascinating piece. In the Tilas Hashem Siddha, so we've got instructions. Now, in the older Tilas Hashem Siddha, there are instructions which are quotes from the Alter Rebbe's Shukhan Aruch. And that was done in the Vilna print, Tafresh Ayin Aleph. And so you've got in a small print, in various places in the Siddha, paragraphs copying from the Alter Rebbe's Shukhan Aruch. When the English translation was published in Tafshin Lamed Ches, I believe, so then we've got a translation of those pieces in Hebrew. The instructions are now repeated in English. Now, let's read this instruction. At the end of Shemun Esther, when finishing Shemun Esther, bow forward. And while bowing, take three steps back. Yeah? Those are the words which we're going um, to focus on. You, take this, you're, you are in a bowed forward um, position, and you step back whilst in bowed position. In the newer edition, which was the annotated version, published in um, 21 years ago, Tafshin Samach Gimel, the instructions had been totally revised, and here it says, take three steps back, then bow. So the instructions have changed. So a teacher somewhere in the tri-state area is teaching his uh, uh, school, his girl, uh, his um, Talmudo is in school, or her, I don't know, and it's this is it's a discrepancy. The girls are used to, they were taught, you step back and then you bow. And the teacher is, you bow and you, you, you step back whilst you're bowed. And then he said, they say, but the kids say it's in the sitter. So then he writes to the editors, where do you get this from? Where do you get this change from? In your early edition, you said one instruction. Now you're saying different instruction. So this is really the way it was presented to me. Trying to understand. So I wrote to the editors of Ed who wrote this text. Okay, but be before uh, dealing with it on the academic level, practically looking around in Shul, if you sometimes see, uh, you, know, you look around, do people step back in the bowed form? Certainly Litvikers do. Litvisha, certainly Litvisha, more learned people will step back in a bowed form and then do their bowing. Most chassidusha, not only the Bavachas, will step back without being bowed. And then once they have stepped back, then they bow to the two sides and then forward. Right? And so what's being recorded here in the Siddha is the common practice. But then we have a problem that it's contradicting to what was said before. And we're going to see it's not just contradicting the Siddha or, or the Altar of Shikhanorok. It goes all the way back. So here we have a Gemara in Yumo Dafnun Gimel. Yum Dafnun Gimel Omid Base. Now, this is in the context of the Kohen Godel stepping out of the Kodesh HaKadoshim. And so, as is common in the Gemara, it goes in to discuss something of similar nature. Rabbi Alexandri says in the name of Shibin Levi, Hamispalil, on his davening, should take three steps back. And then he says, Shalom. Okay, three steps back. Then we have, in the middle of the quote, we have about left and right, or right and left. Greet to your right, greet to your left, and 
we have a conversation here. It doesn't mean your left and your right, but it means to the right of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And therefore, you give... Now, it does not say what it means. When it says, Noisen Sholem li mean by Chakach l'smoil. What do you Noisen Sholem? What do you do? You don't shake hands. So what does it mean, Noisen Sholem? That's cryptic, yeah? Then we have the end of this discussion of the Gemara. Says of Chiyo, Bereda Rav Huna, Chazina lehu la bai barov. I observed bai barov. The pasi lehu sholish besiyois beva bekriya achas. They took three steps back in one bow. So there you are. It says in the Gemara, Rabbi Barovo stepped back three bows, sorry, three steps in one bow. And that's brought in Shukhan Aruch, in Simakuf Chav Gimel, Koireya o Poiseya Sholish Psiois la Acharov, Bechriya Achas. Three steps with one bow. And then he says, after you've stepped the three steps back, then you pay turn to your left, and then you turn to your right, and then you bow forward. Okay, so now what's what's been developed here is that the noisin sholem means to bow. That wasn't written in the Gemara, but that's that. Okay, fine. That the noisin sholem means bowing to your left, bowing to your right. Fine. Before going um, now, then we have Rambam is is, is startling. Because we know that the Tachacham instituted to bow four times of Shmon Esra. Beginning of end of the first bracha, beginning of the end of Maidu. Look at the Rambam Zloshin Perik Hei Aloch Yud. Kriyo Ketzad. Part of the protocol of davening is the bowing. Hamis Palol Koireya Chomesh Kriyos. You have five bows. And he says, first bracha, Maidu is a Tchilo so he's doing he's, he's quoting Mamish Abai Barova that they bow they step back the three steps in one bow. Well, if that's the case, that's written in the Gemara and in the Rambah Manish Khanoruch, that you step back in bowed form, three steps in bowed form. So where does it come from that? The fact that many people don't do that. Okay, so now let's look, look in the Zohar in Parshas Pinchas, I believe, in Perik Gimel. Um, we have on the reference here. Perik Gimel, Reish Rav So the Zohar says, "Kol Hakerei Hakerei Abaruch Kol Zekev Zekev Hashem Zekif Vos Arbo O Kerichos Arbo." You erect yourself four times. You bow yourself four times, and in all, so he says. Therefore, you've got four and four, four bow, four bows, four erecting, four bows. Then he says further. I'm skipping the piece in the middle. It's just uh, not going to help us focus. And you've got four movements. Kriyos keep on the smaller, a bow and an erection to the left. A kriyos kifo liyamino, and a bow and an erection to the right, and he concludes ho inun tresar, four and four and four equals twelve. So the Zohar has, whereas in the Gemara we have a bayavarova stepping back, three steps in one bow, and the Rambam says therefore we've got five bows, and we've got the Zohar is saying there's six. Because it's four in the Shmon Esra and two at Oysa So one to the left, one to the right. So we've got here a very clear uh, conflict between the Gemara and the Zohar. Rabbi Nachum of Lonzano, who I believe was a little bit later than the Arizal, in his Sefer Shte Yodos, he picks up on this. And he also mentions Rabbeinu Yoyna. So in Sefer Hayir of Rabbeinu Yoyna, we have the following words. I just cut out what wasn't relevant. You bow seven times. Yeah, you thought it was okay. Five and six. Now I've got seven. Beginning and the end of Ovis, and then beginning and the end of Moedim. 
This is now, you see, Rabbi Yoyin is translating. Sholem means to bow. Once to the left, Bekoireya. Sholem is a Sholem Bekoireya. Liyamin Bekoireya. Lefono Bekoireya. So he has introduced four and three. Four in the Imen Shemunasre and three. But Tia Kriyar, or then he goes into detail. So the Menachem of Lanzano, he brings together, you got Rabbi Yoyin is saying three at the end. Then we got the Rambam, the Torah, who says, Koireya Psiya, you say, Gimel Psiya, you say, one. Then he says, the Zoyar is Loikiri Brezeh, but Loikiri Brezeh, and he quotes the Zoyar, and it has Arbo Boise Shalom. So we have really very, very confusing. We've got here three opinions. We've got here the ostensible Pshat of the Gemara of three and one, one, one bow. We've got three, and we've got the Zoyar, he's got, he's got two. Very, very interesting. Now, but, 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 you know, we have a general rule. But when there's a conflict between the Zoyer and the and and and, and the uh, Shulchan we would uh, the, and, the, and the Gemara, we would go according to the Gemara. I'm just wondering whether our case, because it's not a Bible said a halacha, this was their practice, and we see in the Zoyer a different practice, whether it's okay in that case to depart from the Hanhog of a Bible and follow the Zoyer and to do. This mean way by the fact you do a third one doesn't matter. Rabbi Yoyin introduces a third one, that's not a problem. But to um, do different to the Gemara, yeah. So now we have in Sefer Hamin Hogim, Sefer Hamin Hogim, as you may know, was compiled by Rabbi Greenglass and Rabbi, Rabbi Groner, Alehem Hashomer. But a lot of the material was actually compiled by the Rebbe uh, in the Chayv or the Friedrich Rebbe. And then he put these, these, these lists of Minhogim in the back of various countries. So in the back of the countries for base this in the Rebbe Rashab Yortzeit and Tovshin Ches. So the Rebbe includes various Minhogim of, 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 of dabbling at the Yomut. And so it's having been talking about filler. In Sefer Amin Hogim, these are quoted. And here he's talking about Oysa Sholem. So in the Rebbe's original form, he's talking about the by Oysa Sholem of Shmanesra and Oysa Sholem of Kaddish. In the Sefer Amin Hogim, they're brought down in two separate locations. But I'm just I'm looking here at the original form. I don't think it makes such a difference. So at Oysa Sholem, out of the quiet Shmanesra, so then, when you say it's a sholem, you are going to bend, you're going to turn and bow to the left. When who is said in the middle, yasa sholem oleinu, you're going to turn and tilt your head to the right, to your right. You're going to face forward. In Kaddish, it's the same but it's the same division, but the directions are the opposite. You're going to turn to your right and bow to your right. And who is middle? You're going to turn to your left. And is going to be to the middle. Okay. So the now I don't want to go into here the fact that the Rebbe himself, at least in the years which we remember, did not follow what's written over here. The Rebbe do Oyser Sholem Bim Rebbe. But here it's written the way he tells us what to do. So in Kabbalah soil, I follow what's, what's written over here. Right. Do what you're told uh, rather than what you think you observe. Okay, fine. But meanwhile, his, this is what is written in, in, in the instructions in, in the Sefer and Hogim, written by the Rebbe. On this, the Rebbe has a note. Re'ebis Yosef. The Rebbe says, admittedly, I have a problem here. I don't know how to resolve this, but he has a problem. So when the Rebbe says that, he gives you two references, plus uh, Nesekalim, which means the commentaries, and he says, I, I have a problem. What is the Rebbe's problem here? So the Shukhanoruch Simukuf Chav Gimel, we already read on the previous page. That, yeah, so we read that already. 
So that's, but I, I did not find anything significant in the Noise Caleb in relation to our discussion. In Simon Nunvov, so the tool is talking about the bows during Kaddish. He says there's four, which are Choivo, Oise, Sholem, Bimroimo, Vekoireya, he shall reshus. The bowing at Oise Sholem is arbitrary. Fine. On this, the Ves Yosef comments. No gusha oise shoi makadish, Hoseya la choirov sholish psias. La achashasia makadish. There's a minig which is not mentioned in the tour. The minig you just take three steps backwards. And it goes to the Prumas Adeshen who says, take three steps back and then you say oise shol. And maybe Rayala does. So what's 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 the what's the problem here? What's the shorich iyun of the? He gives us two references, but so what? What exactly is the shorich here? I'm, I'm not sure. Is it there? There's a conflict between Simon Nunvov and Reish Kuf Chov Gimel. I'm really not sure. But certainly, if you start probing as we have done, that you see that. The, there is a conflict with the Eloshan of the Zoya. And that, I mean, in the way he's, in the way it's presented in the Rebbe's Loshan, it doesn't talk at all about b walking back bowed. On the contrary, he says, you finish Shunasa, you walk, and now you're ready to say Oysa Shalom, and Oysa Shalom is only once you've stepped back. That's very clear. It's only once you've stepped back. Although there are those who say, you say, oh, my God, while you're stepping back. But here you see, he's quoting the Trumas Adeshan. First you step back, and then you say, oh, Yeah. And then he says, once you've stepped back, then you're going to tilt to the left, and then you can tilt to the right. So that seems to be, as we said, like the Zoya, that once you've already stepped back, that's when you bow to the, to the left and the right, rather than stepping back in the bowed form. So... That basically to sum this up. So whilst we have a Gemara which says by a step back um, in a bowed form, but the Zohar is quite clearly not so, and and therefore the fact that we we don't do that has the backing has the basis in the Zohar. Um, there is a sefer called Siach Yitzchok who tries to reconcile the Zohar and the Gemara. Um, you can see it on the screen. I'm not going to spend the time on it. I'm, I'm really, I didn't find his reconciliation very convincing. He's quoted in the Kafachaim, I believe, in Simon Kufchov Gimel. But let's just move. Okay, something much more uh, hands on. A overhang of a sukkah. Someone asked me this week Are they able to make a sukkah and use the wall of the house? as a wall of the sukkah. You can see the overhang is at least 50, 60 centimeters uh, sticking away from the wall. So would you, now can you use this wall of the sukkah, of the, of the house as a wall for your sukkah? So what you can see also on the screen is this diagram, which is taken from the back of the volume uh, six of whatever, of, of Piskei Tshuvis. And it's a bit more clear. When you want to build a sukkah, leaning to a wall, but there's an overhang on top. In order to make this sukkah kosher, you want to use this wall. You're going to have to use two Lomdisha um, solutions. One solution is the famous Doifun Akuma, that within four amas, so if you have a ceiling and a wall, and the ceiling is less than four amas, we say it's as if the wall is tilted, and so that wall can be a wall of the sukkah because the overhang is less than four amas. The problem here is of the the gap that the overhang is is uh, several feet higher than the sukkah, and to in order to kind of um, even out that this the roof and the sukkah are on the same level, there's a concept in halacha called chavoit rimi. You've got something's higher, something's lower, and there, and you as if you can bring the, the the two levels and bring them into one level. 
So you need to use, to make this wall, to be part of the sukkah, you need to chavot remi, to bring down the ceiling in, in, in imaginary uh, to the level of the schach. And then you're going to use the other halacha of doif nakum. So the piskei tshuvis quotes from others, b'shem chaznish, that that is okay. But then he quotes in the notes from others that it's not okay. And he quotes from the state chemed that it's not okay because you can't, you, there's a limit of how far you can go with your imagination. Yeah? And so is all of these imaginary love woods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there is a kind of rule, love is actually the exception to this, that but you wouldn't use two halachas together. So to use a doifun akuma and a good asik, for example, that would not work. Um, so that's that's so that's where we have a problem. So what is the solution to be able to use this wall, uh, as you see in this on the screen, to be a wall of the sukkah? So the simple answer would be on the level of the schach to add a layer, let's say a sheet of plastic on the level of the schach until the wall. In that way, you don't need to rely on the dochavot remi because you have actually a sheet of fossil schach on the level of the schach. And then you need to do your doifun akuma. So, so long as it's less than dal damas, then you're good. I say to use plastic, you could use schach also, but then it's going to be confusing because if the schach, the kosher area is three feet and the two feet are, is possible, if you put schachs there, your users are not going to be aware and they'll look up and they say, oh, they're under the sukkah. So it may be more advisable to have the, the, uh, the postular area to be clearly made of postular material. That's the way it, this can be used. Let's move on. Okay, another interesting topic. Can someone who's sleeping make up your minion for Kriya Satire? So this is in defense of a write-up. There's a, there's a publication called Compass Magazine. That's published by the Shluchim office and has every issue has halacha articles. And they've now published a compendium, second compendium of the halacha articles, which have appeared in Compass. And now there's a separate volume and someone's now picked up on some, is complaining about some of the points which are there. Okay, fine. So this is what I'm re responding to. Now, here we have a simon nun hey. There are those who say that someone who is asleep can make up the minion for Dabba Shibi Kedusha. So even though in sleeping state, they're not able to... Um, yeah? A, a sleeping Jew is also holy... Therefore, he makes up the second opinion says no, doesn't count. Okay, but there is such an opinion. Or let's say a person is davening Shimon Esther, can he make up his minion? Special welcome to Rib Ali Levinson. Um, so now, so that's, 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 that's now here's the question. Is Kriyas HaToyre the same as, as Kaddish? So again, for Kaddish, a person, Davini Shonestra, makes up the minion. For Chazor Sashats, no. For someone who is, uh, middle of Shonestra, let's say, he doesn't make up the minion for Shonestra, for Chazor Sashats, because for Chazor Sashats, you need to have nine people who are listening. Question is now, Kriyas HaToyre. Do you need to have 10 souls in bodies in the room? Or do you have to have nine listeners and a balkoire? You have to have 10, pe 10, 10 people who are focusing. So the Prima Godim actually asks this question. Prima Godim, he asks that which we know that a, a person sleeping makes up the minion in some cases. What about Bible Kriyasa Torah? Is it because it's a Dovashe Bikdusha? So if it's a Dovashe Bikdusha, a person is, is not like for Kaddish. A person is sleeping makes up the minion. But if you say it has to be Bitsibur, therefore you need to have 10 people who are listening. 
and the person who's sleeping does not make up the minion. Now, there's a run who says this these words. So from the run, it looks like that it's there's a need to have ten people. There's no 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 uh, no shortcuts. Curiously, the lavush says it's Kodavash Kedusha. According to that, a person who's sleeping could make up the minion. And this lavush is quoted by the Tzemach Tzedek in a, in, a, in a tshuva. So this fellow is trying to say, well, since the Tzemach Tzedek quotes the lavush who says Kodavash Kedusha, therefore a sleeping person makes up the minion. Uh, my my first response to him is, if you have a ran and a, a lavush, it, the Tzemach Tzedek is not going to dismiss a ran because of the wording of the lavush. Also, it's it's they use words and terms, but it's not you know, because he says the davar shabikdusha does not mean that therefore it's okay for sure to have a person sleepy make up your meal. But what what I'm particularly concerned is that for kriya satoira in a case of a fast day, there's a whole discussion if a person who's not fasting can they make up the meal. And we discussed a few times the Tshuva of Tzemach Tzedek. At the time was there was an epidemic. And he writes, of course, there's several letters of Tzemach Tzedek about this. And there is a Svara to say, if it's one of the fixed fasts, so then it's a day which is established for Kriya Satoira. But if it's just, let's say, a voluntary fast, yeah, uh, a community wanted to fast for a particular thing. Let's say there's a Chevre Kadisha, they, and when they have their fast, they say, by, they read Vayichal, etc. What would happen if, for the Chavra Kedisha, and there's seven of them are fasting, or three of them aren't fasting? Not in line by business, why? Can they do Kriya Satoy? So there the Shukhanoch is very, very clear. Shukhanoch is very clear that you need to have ten who are fasting. And this is actually the Tzemach Tzedek in that Shuva. He also says, um, if it was... In, he says, in the case of the uh, epidemic, there's the three which is fasting. You can read Vayichal. So the Shukhanag is very clear that for, for on a fast day, you need to have 10 fasts. Now, if you're going to tell me that you, that it's enough, if uh, it's a Dovah Shavik Dusha, so it's um, the person who's sleeping makes up the, the minion. Because you need to have 10 people in the room, but it's enough to have six people who are listening to Kriya Satoira. Really? So why in the fast did you need to have 10? Elamai is a raya that Kriya Satoira needs to have 10 people who are listening. Yeah? So from I'm, I'm bringing a raya. The Mr. Brewer, by the way, he he addresses this, um, the Primigodim, and he takes very strongly the view that you need to have 10 people who are listening, that sleeping person um does not make up the, the shear or the minion. You see this? Um, he says you need to, I think it's in Kufmim Gimel, is it somewhere? He says that the person who is sleeping does not make up the minion. And he says, with this, I'm answering the dilemma of the Premier Godim, which I quoted in Simonun Hay. He's questioning whether a sleeping person makes up the minion. And from the Bahag and the roof, in Mashbad Loimahani, that a, a person who is sleeping does not make up the minion. And I'm just adding another proof from the dinim of. See here, you have in Shukhanar very clearly. Im yeshatzor or detzaisi, let's say for Torah, talking about you have to have ten people listening. And then, if you are learning something, or you're doing your own thing, can you stay in the corner and do your own thing? But you need to have ten people listening. That's written in the Shukhanar, and so it says asor. It doesn't say roi vasor. Uh, but then I'm bringing another raya from the Indian of the fast. Let's move on. Um. Just following on from our discussion about um, about uh, the, the the hoodie which had the name God written on the sleeve, about wearing it, etc. Someone actually asked me, "What about a, a pendant which is made with American coin which has in God we trust? Would they be allowed to go into a bathroom wearing that pendant?" Okay, good question. Um, but generally, about this union of being careful, as I mentioned last week, how in Chabad we are particular. 
in our publications. It's G D, not G O D, because of the warrior becoming um, dis disgraced. So we've got the source in the Urim Vitumim, and he talks about Adieu, which I mentioned last week, and it being um, people who are writing Adieu in a um, in a letter, and then it ends up in the in the in the waste. And then the uh, Nesiva Samishpat, also in Simichov Zayin in Yeredeya, sorry, in Mechesh Mishpat, he also says, Vayidal Yisroel, he says, this is the cause for poverty, uh, for widespread poverty, because Shem Shomayim is left to disgrace. But Tzorich is Chakmus Vishkidus, Tchachas Chachmin Hadar. There needs to be a wise a strategy, a strategizing and diligence. To for um, to chastise and to make peace it right, as this is what I mentioned last week. I tell the the, the Talmudos, don't say, "Oh my God," a Yiddish a from person does not say that. You can find anything else, but you don't use God unless it is in a serious uh, context of prayer, etc. Um, and for that matter, not to write in a geras sholem the word God, um, as we so, although the Alter Rebbe we discussed last week says that, quoting the Shach, that there's no Kedusha in the word God written in another language, but we have various other sources who take the view that there is Kedusha, and therefore you should be careful to avoid disgracing um, G-O-D, even though it's not in, in, in Hebrew, obviously. Okay, um, running out of time. So, quickly, what about, uh, someone asked me today, that several people who are, let's say, someone, someone just got married, so they come home, and they've got boxes of dishes, so they get a few friends together, relatives, and they go over to the mikvah, and they're all toiling in So, you've got five people there standing around, one bracha or several brachas. Does each worker make a separate bracha, or one bracha set for everything? So, I'm going to analyze this, and, and I, which I wrote to this person, You've got the Baal HaMitzvah and you've got the Poyale HaMitzvah. There's one Baal HaMitzvah, one owner of the Mitzvah, and there are those who are carrying out the Mitzvah, implementing, they are several. So do we go to the Baal HaMitzvah or do we, for the Baruch, go to the Poyale HaMitzvah? So another parallel to this would be the case of B'dikas Chometz. I've got a Mitzvah of B'dikas Chometz, I've got a big house, Baruch Hashem, and I'm delegating part of the search, to this one, to that one, so I am the Baal mitzvah, and I've got another three, Hoya mitzvah, one bracha or several brachas. And over there, the Alter Rebbe takes the view that you should make one bracha, and the others should start off in the room where the bracha was said, and then go elsewhere. But here's very interesting. On every Friday evening, before Shabbos, before sunset, Neshe Yisroel, Make a bracha on on, on the hadlik near Shabbos Kodesh, and if there's a daughter or several daughters, so they're also going to make a bracha on their lighting. So imagine a cake, and there's several slices. So you've got here a mitzvah, and there's a mitzvah to make the house bright, and mommy takes a slice and she makes slice several she makes slices yeah that's several candles, and then her daughters come. For Shabbos, and she also lights. She's also making it bright. Another slice of the cake, and then little girl, another slice of the cake. There's a cake. There's in other words, there's a unit called the mitzvah of hadlokas neir to make light in the house. And you've got several people to be taking slices of that mitzvah, and they're doing it. So you've got here one bala mitzvah. There's one owner for this house, and poyalea mitzvah. You've got several who are several women, girls. Who are implementing this mitzvah. And the meaning there is that each one makes their own bracha. And the Alter Rebbe discusses this in Simeresh Samach Gimel. And he says it should be only one bracha. And there are those who allow you to allocate the bracha to be said by those other poyalai mitzvah. Okay, so back to the, so there is, so what my answer to the, the to be last Kalen question was, I the the advice is one person makes the bracha, and all the others are, are, are listening and answer omen and and and, and uh, If you push comes to shove, there would be there's room to be makel, 
but it's it's not advisable. Um, especially also, I don't know what what they are traveling is it all in metal and glass, or some of them are just traveling um, China, etc. Which doesn't need to. You don't make a brocha if you're traveling China. You still you, should, you don't need to, and you, if you do, you don't make a brocha for sure. Right. Um, right. We're almost finished, and someone, one of our listeners who listens to the recording, he lives somewhere in uh, Greater New York, and he asked me that he davens in his in his area. There's a Sephardi shul, and he noticed that men that they generally sit through Kaddish, whereas in Ashkenazi minion we generally see people standing. And he asked, "Is this a Sephardi Ashkenazi thing?" So here we have again from Simon Nun Nun Let's read this inside, and we'll this. Or we'll conclude, there are those who say that you do not need to stand for Kaddish and Borchu unless Tov Umad. You were already standing for whatever reason, so then you stay standing. Like for art, you said Halal, standing. So you, you, you stay standing for the Kaddish. So that's the Arizal. The Arizal said you do not need to stand up for Kaddish. There are those who say you should stand up for Kaddish. And we learn this from Egloin, the king of Moyov, who stood. When uh, the when the shayfit came along to say he has the bar Hashem for him, therefore we should take heed. So we have it too, min, min hogim. Yes, indeed, it is a Sephardi Ashkenazi thing that the Ashkenazi minhig is generally to encourage to stand for Dovah Shem uh, The Sephardi approach is you do not have to stand for Dovah Shem like the like the Rizal. We had the whole discussion in the uh, last few weeks. We had about standing or sitting for Kriya Satoira. And what did remain was there is a mile in standing for Kriya Satoira. But uh, if you are if you are tired or uh, don't have, you're a bit, feeling a bit frail, then it's okay to sit all the way through. Okay, I'm going to start with that. I wish you all a good Shabbos, a good Chodesh, and La'alta L'Tshuva, La'alta L'Gu'ula. And we should have a Gu'ula Shlema. Mashiach Tidkeno, Bimhedo, Vyameinu Mamish. Call to Amen.